If you're looking for a place to go and find some trophies, this is the place to be in the charge of no fees. If you're on Xbox and need some game to score, come over here, I'll help you get some more. My name is Ken Zedretro, the host of the show, gaming news and reviews and all you need to know. Because the weekend is finally here at last, sit back, relax, enjoy the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Yep, folks, Star Wars is glass. Because <laughs> I went to see the uh, Han Solo Star Wars film last night, and it had its moments, yes. They didn't waste any time with a romance subplot, though. Uh, a few twists that I couldn't quite get my head around. And what else? It, f it definitely felt more like a sci-fi action film than a Star Wars film. But anyway. Overall, it was okay. Nothing spectacular. I enjoyed it. And it's definitely going to be in my top... Definitely going to be up there as a contender f in my top ten... Films of wait, hang on, something isn't quite set up here. Oh, wait a minute, hang on. A That explains it. I've actually put it away in my OneDrive folder. But anyway, hello, my fellow Latter Day Saints. Kenzie Bechtel, the Mormon Entertainer here, the most inspirational Mormon in all of Asia here, back once again for another edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Oh, goody! My first, my first edition of the podcast since E3. And let's just say there's been a lot of juicy news over the course of the last week. Uh, there, there's a lot of news, um, Overwatch, uh, Blizzard teasing a, a new Overwatch hero or a new map, uh, Xbox One not getting VR support, uh, news on Pokemon Let's Go, Fallout 76, Crackdown 3, interestingly, and, uh, Crossplay as well. This is going to be interesting. Um, fake Fortnite Android apps are spreading across the internet as well. Um, there's uh, also Nintendo dropping the ban hammer on uh, on uh, pirates as well, for whatever reason. Uh, right there we go. So yeah. Um, and of course in the points and trophies section just got my latest boomerang rental just yesterday gravel those are the achievements I'm going to be going through today all that coming up on today's edition of the trophy achievement podcast but before that big shout out as always to my good friends over at boomerang rentals like I said, packages start from as little as three ninety nine a month. Sign up today, get a twenty one day free trial, three free game rentals. There are no late fees. You can keep the game as long as you like, or keep the game forever at a discounted price on the online store. Once you st once you start renting, you'll start saving as well. Boomerangrentals.co.uk, the best place to rent your games. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything. Tee hee hee. 
Ah, I love that jingle, and that means it is time for the Gaming Scrop of the Week. <laughs> and it's a very juicy one at that. And by juicy, I mean it's not regarding EA, it's not regarding Activision, it's not even regarding Konami. It is, in fact, regarding the World Health Organization. I know what you're thinking. The World Health Organization as a gaming screw-up of the week? How exactly does that work? Well, let's find out, shall we? Because this is where things get very interesting. Prepare for a substantial rant on this topic. I might be here a while. So, Let's do this, shall we? This is on June 19th by TechSpot. It's on the TechSpot website. World Health Organization officially classes gaming disorder, which should never have been thought of to begin with, as a mental condition. Are you serious? Kids, would you step outside for a second? Dear Lord, that's the loudest profanity I've ever heard! Now, let's read what the article actually says. Let's read what it actually says. So, here we go. Back in December, the World Health Organization surprised gamers and many medical professionals alike by including gaming disorder, the, in, the including is underlined, gaming disorder in its beta draft of International Classification of Diseases for 2018. Now, the updated 11th version of the ICD has been released and with it comes the official definition of gaming addiction as a mental health disorder. The volume diagnoses the condition as being identified by three signs. Impaired control over gaming. For example, onset, frequency, intensity, duration, termination, and context. Doesn't exactly help us with what it actually means increasing proximity given to gaming to the extent that gaming takes pre prece precedence over other life interests and daily activities hmm continuation or escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences now that last one i'm sorry big no no and i'll get into why shortly. According to the ICD-11, the behavioural pattern of someone suffering from gaming disorders results in significant impairment in personal, family, social, educational, occupational or other important areas of functioning. Dr. Vladimir Pozniak, the World Health Organization member who proposed the new diagnosis, good grief, of course it would be a Russian, told CNN, I'm not taking, I'm not creating a precedent. Uh, you clearly have if you propose this to begin with. He said, World Health, he said, well, the World Health Organization has followed the trends, developments, developments which have taken place in populations and in the professional field. So, essentially you're going to be classing esports gamers with gaming disorder. It's going to get to that point, folks, where they're going to class esports gamers with gaming disorder.
The trends. Uh, do, do, do. Most of the medical profession is against the gaming disorder inclusion. Why does that not surprise me? Two papers opposing the proposal having already been released. In the UK, the country's National Health Service, that's right here to be, ex that's right here to be uh, exact, folks, has now started offering free treatment for those experiencing the disorder. Yeah, how do you diagnose the disorder, though? Though exactly what treatment would be most effective is still under discussion. The gaming industry is also speaking out against the move. Thank you! Yesterday, a statement co-signed by the ESA, ESAC, EGDF, IESA, IGEA, ISFE, K Games, and UBVNG explained that video games across... Take note! Take note, you World Health Organization clowns! Video games across all kinds of genres, devices, and platforms are enjoyed safely and sensibly by more than two billion people worldwide with the take note with the educational therapeutic and recreational value of games being well founded and widely recognized we are therefore concerned to see gaming disorder still contained in the latest version of Who's ICD-11? Despite significant, despite significant opposition from the medical and scientific community. The evidence for its inclusion remains highly contested and inconclusive because it doesn't explain how it works. It doesn't explain properly how it works. It's important to note that ICD-11 has not yet been finalised, and the current draft won't be submitted until next year. As the online version points out, content in this platform may change on an ongoing basis. Video game addiction has come under the spotlight again recently, following news of a nine-year-old girl being placed into rehab because she couldn't stop playing Fortnite. The gaming community has spoken, you clowns. And what it is basically saying is video games are good. They can tell stories. They can immerse you in the world that they have created. They have some amazing soundtracks. Just look at Ori in the Blind Forest. Yes, I know! I know I keep singing Ori's praises! Shut up! You're never going to hear me say anything negative about Ori on this channel. That's how much I love that game. I'm looking forward to Will of the Wisps coming out. But these well, like I say, these World Health Organization clowns do not have a clue what they're doing. Because I guarantee you, the World Health Organization clowns that create, that came up with this proposal, don't even play video games to begin with! There are people who review video games for a living. You're gonna class them with gaming disorder as well? There are people like me who cover games on my channel. Not extensively, but my point still stands. You're gonna class people like me with gaming disorder as well? Professional esports e gamers, let's players, reviewers. 
I mean, I mean, heaven forbid, people who actually... People who actually make these games, you're gonna class them with gaming disorder?! You idiots! And now you guys know why this is the biggest gaming screw-up of the week. Worse than EA screw-ups. Worse than Activision screw-ups. This is the biggest pile of trash I have ever come across. Video games are enjoyable. They are therapeutic. And they do good for the world. It gives us a chance to escape reality. The fact that you've classed this as a mental condition degrades those that suffer from mental health issues like myself right now. Unless you've experienced video games yourself, don't you dare degrade those with mental health conditions with another one to add to their list. A former Love Island contestant died yesterday because of mental health issues. An absolute joke this is. The fact that these articles come up and degrade people with mental health issues, it just makes them all the worse. My point still stands. Unless you've experienced video games yourself, do not degrade video games. And regarding off Island folks, I don't I don't watch it, but it's a real shame that people are still taking their own lives through mental health issues. Anyway, on to more positive news. This is not a drill, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a drill. Trading is now available in Pokemon Go. Ah, so that's how it works. So you'll only be able to trade with people nearby, but costs can be reduced by leveling up your friendship. Okay. And this is on the IGN website. Okay. So, as it stands, trading is now available in Pokemon Go. Well, at the time the article was written, trading is now available in Pokemon Go for players level 30 and above. That includes me. Whoop whoop! It's expected to be ruled out to more players at other levels in the coming days. Right, so here we go. Nearly two years after the launch, trading is now officially coming to Pokemon Go. Niantic announced this morning that trading will arrive 
alongside a new friend system which will offer various social features online or nearby. Each player will have their own trainer code that then that they can share with friends to exchange friend requests. Once someone has accepted your friend request, that player will appear on your friends list where where you can interact in various ways in a Q in a Q&A for members at the press of the press at E3, Niantic software engineer Kirsten Koa clarified some of the new features surrounding friends, including trading special new eggs and a new gifts feature and more. Once you've added a friend, you'll be able to achieve one of four friendship levels. Good friend, great friend, ultra friend and best friend for life. <laughs> Raising your friendship level will offer various bonuses, including reduced star dust costs for trades, extra damage during gym battles alongside a friend, and additional premier balls during raids alongside a friend. Hmm. These are the bonuses for each friendship level. Good friend, trade all Pokemon except mythical. Great friend, star dust discount for trading, attack bonus during gym battles with that friend, or and one additional premier ball for raids alongside that friend. Ultra friend, additional stardust discount for trading. Al al additional stardust kiss discount for for trading. A, t a larger attack bonus during gym battles with that friend, and two additional premier ball balls for raids alongside that friend. And best friend, major stardust discount for trading. Al for trading. Largest attack bonus during gym battles with that friend, and four additional premier balls for raids alongside that friend. But it doesn't say anything regarding the raid battles themselves, apart from the premier balls. Cohen noted that these bonuses will not stack. Ooh. Right. Right, let's see. Cohen noted that these bonuses will not stack. For example, if you're raiding with a best friend, which gives you four extra balls during raids, and an ultra friend with, that gets two extra raids during raids, you'll only receive the bonus from the single highest friend in your raid group. So you'd only get four extra balls for the raid, not six. Seems fair. Okay, so this is going to be interesting. Right, here we go. You can increase your friendship level with a particular friend by sending gifts. See below. Trading or participating in gym battles or raids together. Ah, so that's how you can do it. Your friendship level can only increase once per day per friend. And Koa explained the following ranges for achieving a friendship level. A good friend, one day. Great friend, seven days. Ultra friend, 30 days. Best friend, 90 days. That explains that explains why there's all why that explains why there's only um uh, the gold one is for three uh, uh um become best friends with three people. See, hang on a second. So anyway, 
Let's see. Uh, you can increase the friendship level. Yada yada yada. The current cap for each player's friends list is 200 friends. But Koa said the number could grow in the future. And the antic will never require players to pay for additional friend space with, like with bag or Pokemon storage. Fair play. Trading Stardust and Pokemon IVs. This is very important, folks. Trades will only be possible with players on your friends list, and only if you're within 100 meters of one another. Players will need a minimum trainer level of 10 in order to participate in trades. You'll also be able to participate in a special trade, which is for legendary. Ah! There we go. That's what we're after. You'll only be a, you'll also be able to participate in a special in a special trade, which is for legendary Pokemon, shiny Pokemon, or Pokemon not currently in your Pokedex. This way, I can get the regionals. And the other legendaries as well. You can only make a single special trade once per day. Not once per day per friend. Only one per day total. Koa clarified that this once a day limit does not refer to a 24 hour time period. And confirmed that it will reset at midnight like with catch and spin streaks. So this is on the trading. All trades will require Stardust, with massively reduced cost depending on your friendship level. An, exam an example in screenshots released by Niantic shows a 1, 000, a 1, 1 million star Stardust fee for a special trade, reduced to just 40,000 if players are best friends. Koa confirmed that both players will pay the same Stardust fee for each trade. Players will also receive candy bonuses, depending on the original catch location of the Pokemon being traded. Oh, If the Pokemon were caught far apart, you'll receive extra candy. The current upper limit on these bonuses is a 100km bonus distance between the Pokemon's original locations. Oh, okay. Finally, the HP and C so right. So you can so say you get So say you caught a Pokemon in Glasgow, for instance. And somebody caught one here. Where I'm staying right now. It would be the distance between those two locations it would be the distance between those two locations that would count towards that distance anyway finally the HP and CP of Pokemon traded to friends will be Oh, the HP and CP of Pokemon traded to friends will be reset, resulting in random new IVs for the Pokemon you receive. The range of possible HP and CP outcomes can be extremely wide or extremely narrow depending on your friendship levels, with best friends much more likely to receive stronger Pokemon. Oh, right. Hmm, that could make things very interesting. Pokestops will now occasionally drop gifts, which you can send to friends on your list. Gifts will include a postcard from the Pokestop where you picked up the gift, as well as a rare item. Koa clarified that these items include rare items within a normal Pokestop pool, hyper potions, revives, etc. And not raid or research exclusive items like rare candy or TMs. When a player receives a gift, they'll also have a chance to receive a new 7km egg, which will eventually hatch to reveal an Alolan Pokemon. That I can get behind.
The particular Pokemon in the 7km eggs will be exclusive to hatching, though this will not be the only way to receive Alolan Pokemon moving forward. Other Alola forms like the previously released Exeggutor, which for some reason is a dragon, and the recently announced Diglett and Geodude will still spawn in the wild. Up more upcoming new features. Niantic also teased more new additions to Pokemon coming to Pokemon Go, including new music and additional social features. New music, eh? Hmm, okay. Niantic said the new friend features are outlined above, including trading, are coming soon and are expected to be released before this year's Pokemon Go Fest, which will take place on July 14th and 15th in Chicago. Niantic product marketing manager Kento Suga said the goal is to make Pokemon Go the most sociable game in the world and to keep an eye out for new features. One example of a new social feature on Pokemon Go's roadmap is the ability to add friends via Facebook. Ooh. But Niantic couldn't confirm when to expect that or any other in-game social features in the future. Um, how about actually fixing the main issues with the game before doing anything else? So, on to the next one. Epic Games plans big changes for Fortnite Endgame, but that's not the only thing we have regarding that. Right, so here we go. Right, so here we go. Fortnite could be about to get its biggest gameplay shakeup in months, as Epic say they don't want it to always end with just build lol. <laughs> it might be the most popular game in the world, but if you've ever played any amount of Fortnite, then you know how it usually ends. With shotguns, and a few remaining players desperately trying to build barriers to hide behind. When the Battle Royale game is down to its last few players, it can get disappointingly samey, and creators Epic Games are trying to figure out a way to change it. Writing in the new blog, they insist that they are trying to create more strategies to win the game. It's important to support a variety of late game strategies that don't boil down to just build lol. We strongly believe that the evolution of Fortnite supports a wide range of playstyles and counterplay, reads the blog. Currently, the, superior, the superiority of shotguns, rockets, and uncapped building are such a dominant playstyle in the final circle that most other strategies are being drowned out. Epic has already made changes to the effectiveness of shotguns and in and in the blog also talk about adding resource caps so that it will be more difficult to build complex structures. Not every encounter should have to end in a build-off, says the blog. 
We want to empower you to showcase your skill, strategy, and tactics in all in a whole variety of ways. The interesting thing is that they are planning to implement at least some of these changes over the next few weeks, which means Fortnite could be substantially different, a substantially different experience within just a month or so. Hmm. Interesting. I should get I should get myself into Fortnite at some point. I mean, I played a few games of Fortnite, but I should get myself properly into it. 2K looks to double gaming portfolio over the next five years. Ooh, now this could be interesting. Made up of half a dozen of a half dozen studios responsible for games like Bioshock 2, Civilization, and Mafia 3. Not to mention the NBA 2K games as well, which are much better than the NBA Live games. 2K Games is looking to grow significantly by 2023, 2K President David Ismailer told Variety. Our aspiration is to double our size in five years, he said, and they seem to be in a position to do that. Parent company Take-Two Interactive is the publisher behind Grand Theft Auto V, which sold about 95 million copies and continues to bring in a steady stream of cash four years after its release. Gee, well, it's nearly five in fact. Take-Two has been slowly investing some of that cash in acquisitions. Last year, they co the, the company snagged Kerbal Space Program and then launched a new publishing label, Private Division. The company also founded Ghost Story Games last year. Ismail had said Take-Two has put a lot of trust in 2K to grow and expand its portfolio and that the company is looking to 2K to essentially wisely invest some of its profits. With that in mind, Ismail has said 2K has three priorities right now. Grow its portfolio, create more content, and find a way to keep gamers and com to keep the gamers the company attracts inside its games. Just ask the NBA 2K series. I love it. 2K6 2K16 was my favorite, but 2K14 was the first one I actually played. That's what got me into basketball properly. I think of games as an amusement park, as Mailer said. The more eyes there are, the more people come and the longer they stay. He added that when he took over leadership of 2K last year, his focus became to empower studios through more resources, a better infrastructure, and creative freedom to publish their games. More games could mean tapping into the company's many untouched IP, creating entirely new games, or expanding on games that have already seen some success. We have our eyes on a lot of things, he said. Take-2's appearance on the E3 show floor this year is an accidental metaphor for the current state of the company. The booth was massive, decked out to look like a standing, luxurious office with a glassed-in waiting room, massive video screens to recreate a view of a beach through four windows and the sky. Oh, that's handy. Complete with a sunset and the occasional birds. I like that. But the company had no games to show at E3. At least, not in its elaborate booth. It was an infrastructure in need of more content. The booth did have another, more sensible purpose though, as a place to host meetings with potential developers, partners, perhaps even acquisition targets. Ooh. While 2K is absolutely in need of more games to put under development, Ismailer said they don't want to force any of the existing studios like Civilization and XCOM Creator Fire Axis to do something they're not interested in. This is how you this is how you treat your studios, EA. This is how they should be treated. You don't give them stuff they don't want. Whatever they are passionate about doing is what Fire Axis will work on next, he said. We can't guide the creatives to do something. It's really difficult to manage very large teams. It's even more difficult if they're not passionate about the project they are working on. Ismailer also declined to say that ha what Hangar 13, the relatively new studio that developed Mafia 3 in 2016, is working on other than to say it's something incredibly exciting and that it is an entirely new IP. Oh, excellent, we're going to get a new franchise out of this. Fantastic. They did Mafia 3 and we were very happy with the results and then they moved on to some other project, he said. Take-Two chairman and CEO Strauss Zelnik 
essentially said the same thing to Variety during E3. We are generally focusing on encouraging our creative teams to pursue their passions and make the extraordinary art that they can make in the form of video games, he said. Ismail has said his team is looking at all kinds of quality content. We are open for business, he said. We are looking to grow and we look at a lot of pitches per year. They are busy, they create good games, and they let the developers create what they want. Like I said, EA, this is how you treat your video game studios. You don't acquire them, give them a project they can't do, and then shut them down. Ah, PayPal calls its account of Active Shooter Publisher. Oh, yeah, this game should not. Yeah, this game should not have been made. Right. Let's see. Active Shooter is a tactical FPS designed to simulate school shootings. That is that right out of the gate. I mean, whichever clown thought this was a good idea should have been... Keep it PG. Keep it family friendly. Should have been kicked out of the office. And never been allowed to make the game to begin with. Active School, Active Shooter is a tactical FPS designed to simulate school shootings, which has unsurprisingly already been the subject of plenty of controversy. As of today, it can no longer be purchased via PayPal. How about actually taking it off the store and making sure that it never be seen again? The Associated Press reports that PayPal has closed the account of publisher Acid Software. Oh, good grief, Acid Software. Everybody in Acid Software should be fired for what, for what they should have done. For, they should have been fired for what they did here. Barring it from one of the most popular means of online paint. PayPal has a long-standing, well-defined and consistently enforced acceptable use policy and regardless of the individual or organization in question, we work to ensure that our services are not used to accept payments for activities that promote violence. As the software confirmed the closure on Twitter, adding the hashtags quit censoring us, freedom of expression, and we will be back. I'm sorry, but I have to agree with PayPal on this one. You cannot create games like this and not expect to have backlash from it. They actually thought creating a game that simulates school shootings would be a very good idea. HAVE YOU NOT SEEN WHAT'S BEEN HAPPENING IN AMERICA?! All this, all this game does is encourage more school shootings. That's all this game does. The studio has also removed the option to purchase Active Shooter on its own site, at least for now. However, the, a free demo is still available. Active Shooter was previously banned from Steam, along with everything else by Acid Software and developer Revived Games, with Valve calling the man behind Acid, Ata Burdiev, 
a troll with a history of customer abuse, publishing copyrighted material, and user review manipulation. Active Shooter's Indiegogo campaign was also removed. How about getting this guy fired and making sure he's not seen again? In a statement to AP, Bardiev said it seems like everyone in the US is trying to censor us. Good! Because this game shouldn't have been made! Whilst not, whilst not explaining ex what exactly we are violating. Um, you created a game that simulates school shootings, which are already a major issue in America! As its Twitter account indicates more information is forthcoming, as the publisher figures out how to continue selling its games. How about just shutting down? Shock and surprise, more news regarding Activision. <sighs> Call of Duty Black Ops 4 attempts to add some Rainbow Six Siege DNA. Rainbow Six Siege. Rainbow Six Siege. Another copy and paste! Do something new for once! Stop copy and pasting! In a time where Call of Duty sometimes takes undeserved flack, more like very well deserved. Oh, good grief. What? What's this guy been on? Oscar Deus on GameSpot. What have you been on? In a time where Call of Duty sometimes takes undeserved flack, I have been a huge supporter of the series efforts to stay fresh every year. <laughs> yeah, very lackluster efforts. They only copy and paste. Over the past decade, we've seen the franchise visit modern day, World War II, Vietnam, and various futuristic settings that nobody cared about. The only games they cared about were the first Black Ops, the first Modern Warfare, and Modern Warfare 2. And World at War for that matter. And that's it! We've seen it be a traditional boots-on-the-ground shooter, an over-the-top military blockbuster, a psychological thriller, and a what-if sci-fi doomsday tale, complete with rocket boosters and exoskeletons. Last year we were told Call of Duty Infinite Warfare was the wrong game at the wrong time. It was the wrong game that should never have been made to begin with. With the implication being that audiences were sick of futuristic warfare, after three games in a row set beyond the present day. That made it an odd decision then for Call of Duty World War II successor once again to head back to the future. You idiots! You could have made Black Ops 4 set in the Korean War. Just a suggestion. You could have used the Korean War. But no! You have to go back to the future. We're gonna have jetpacks, we're gonna have exoskeletons, we're gonna have Battle Royale when we've got PUBG and Fortnite to already take care of that! In what is presumably an attempt to ground the game in a way Black Ops 3 did not, the latest in the subseries omits its predecessor's double jumps and heads once again back to basics. Sort of. It's not back to basics if it's sort of. While Black Ops 4's futuristic agility powers may have been scrapped, good, the somewhat generic near future set has been preserved. Why am I not surprised? 
I don't think many people had a problem with rocket boosters. To the contrary, I think rapid movement capabilities, the rapid move, move, movement capabilities they brought have come to define the series. Rather, I think people were sick of the near future aesthetic and storyline. They're just sick of the same copy and paste gameplay they see every single year. I certainly was, but Black Ops 4 maintains that the drops maintains that and drops the most interesting part of the advanced Call of Duty games. The movement. How exactly are they dropping the oh, the and this doesn't mean Call of Duty has slowed down. However, Black Ops 4 is just as fast as you've come to expect from the series. You can, you can't, you just can't wall run like you could. You just can't wall run like you could in previous games. Like you could in Vast Warfare, Infinite Warfare, or Black Ops 3. In a half hour multiplayer hands on demo at E3, it became apparent that Call of Duty is still very energetic. Its map still t its maps still turn into racetracks and its matches are just as frantic as ever. How do the maps turn into racetracks? Can somebody fire this guy? This makes no sense. One of Black Ops 4's big changes is the removal of regenerating health. And the addition of health packs. Call of Duty World War 2 introduced this in its campaign, but multiplayer returned to the standard always recovering health system. Black Ops 4 goes all the way and brings the tweak to multiplayer. Yeah, why not have a single player campaign instead of the Battle Royale mode? However, while the change might seem a big one for the series to make, it is moving more towards Battlefield, Fortnite and PUBG in practice. It makes little difference. It makes little difference exactly because of Black Force at full, because of Black Ops 4 at full mentioned speed and typically high impact weaponry, you don't tend to live very long. So it's rare you have the opportunity to heal before being killed. Even when you do, your health pack with every character automatically gets from the start, replenishes quickly. So there's little strategy around when to activate it. <sighs> Call of Duty games have never been about strategy. The much flaunted tactical improvements, if you can call them that. Most notably, the specialist individual skills such as deployable barriers and barbed wire are similarly less notable in game than they might appear. Yes, you can deploy a wire fence here or bulletproof barricade there. And the comparisons to something slower and more thoughtful like Rainbow Six Siege are easy and fair to make. But you move around so much and die so quickly in Call of Duty that you'll never be around long enough to feel the benefit of your equipment. Other abilities such as a flamethrower or a grenade launcher have been seen before and so don't prove the breath of fresh flame, I thought they might. Black Ops 4 being more similar to its predecessors than expected is not necessarily a bad thing, however. The Call of Duty series is famed for its satisfying gunplay, and that is no different in Black Ops 4. It feels typically excellent to land a headshot from across the map. <laughs> yeah, quick scopes. As you'd expect, and as you'd expect, and the two maps I played, Contraband and Frequency, both contained excellent layouts that funneled players in exactly the right way for interesting engagements. Black Ops 4 will of course be fun to play, just don't expect its core multiplayer mode to be very different to anything that has come before. Oscar is GameSpot's staff writer and, and as the youngest member of the UK office he's usually the butt of the joke. Get that guy fired because his head's up in the clouds.
a new overwatch. Something is on the horizon. Let's try and... Wrists and stab this world around me just to scream. That, uh, that was not planned. I swear my life that was not planned. But that voice though. Wow. Anyway, Blizzard is teasing something new for Overwatch. It hasn't been especially long since Overwatch's last new character and map were added, but Blizzard seems to be already teasing what the shooter's next player or hero or locale will be. It's very... All very it's all very mysterious for now, but based on the teasers released in the past, we can expect several follow-ups in the coming days. This first teaser is accompanied by the words, Calm Before the Storm. It shows what looks like an alleyway with a variety of sprays and posters on the wall. Among these is one of Lucio. One calling for rights for Omnix, essentially robots, and another calling for no robots. It's possible some hidden clue awaits, but there's nothing that immediately stands out. Check it out yourself below. Hmm. That's it. As it stands, Overwatch has a total of 27 characters. The most recent of the bunch was Bridget, a support character who can heal teammates, equip a barrier shield, and stun enemies. So far, Blizzard hasn't given any indication of what to expect from the next character, nor do we know when they will be released. As always though, any new addition to the roster has the chance to dramatically shape up, shake up the game, both for casual players and on the competitive slash Overwatch League side. What we can expect new characters for Overwatch to continue to roll out, as Blizzard does seem keen on moving to an Overwatch 2. What people might not realise is the team now is significantly bigger than it was when, they sh when we shipped the game. And we have to pull out pull all of we have to put all of that into working on the live game and the new maps, heroes, and events like Anniversary. The studio said recently, at least for the time being, supporting Overwatch is our focus right now, and we're excited to work on the game. Hmm. interesting I would say. Right. So as it stands we don't know what's going to be happening. Right, I've been at this for just about an hour now so what's going to happen is I'm uh, going to need to split this into two parts. Part two will be available tomorrow and uh, then that leaves the Tom and Jerry sins to go up on the Sunday instead of their usual Saturday slot because there is so much news to get through. But anyway, if you enjoyed what you've if, if you enjoyed what you've seen so far, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be baptized into following this channel, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell to join the latter day scenes notification squad so you don't miss anything I do on this channel. Um, yesterday I started my playthrough of Tarzan, which is on the left, and on the right my dedicated trophy achievements podcast playlist. Part two will be available tomorrow and I will be doing the and I'll be recording the Tom and Jerry Sins tomorrow as well so that they are up for Sunday. So anyway in the meantime 
I'll see you guys again very soon. Have a fantastic day. Peace out and stay faithful.